I regret to inform you that I had to interrupt my PAL World session to read this intro, but hey, look at the bright side. There are some pals in the deep woods waiting for you right now. Big, hairy, sharp-toothed pals that might be a little bit upset if you tried to throw your ball at them. Welcome to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter, at Dark Prevails, where I have engaging conversations with my fans, like whether or not your parents made you say sir or ma'am. People brought up a lot of trauma with that one. Anyway, today's episode features deep woods encounters that will scare your socks right off. And if you're not wearing socks, then you're missing out, cause socks are awesome. Enjoy, and don't forget, I dare you to scare me. Send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org, and we shall see if my socks stay on or not. Also, join me on my Discord via the link in the description. It would be cool to start doing some contests, giveaways, or other cool things there. Now, let's begin. Willow River From Inquisitor 4196 This may be one of the scariest encounters I've had in my entire life so far. It was December, a few days after Christmas. I decided to go hunting with a friend of mine. We'll call him Gabe. Gabe had agreed to go hunting with me as he didn't have much to do at the time, and he wanted to get away from his girlfriend for a while. They'd been fighting a bit, and he needed a break from that. I had him drive over to my place with all his stuff ready to go. When he arrived, I was almost ready myself, just needed to grab primer for my gun of choice, the muzzle loader. I loaded up all my stuff in his truck, locked up my house, and got in the front seat. We drove off. I was living in Minnesota at the time, and I still do, but we chose one of the worst place I could have chosen for the hunt. As we drove there, we talked about the hunting conditions at the place. Specifically, we were heading for a cabin on Sturgeon Lake. After the two-hour drive, we finally arrived and got out of the truck. We went in the cabin and got settled in. By then, we were quite tired, so we decided to go to bed. We would get things set up in the morning. A while later, Gabe had fallen asleep, but I was still awake. I had this feeling of dread that I couldn't explain, like someone or something was watching me through the window. I got up and went to close it. Before I was able to close it, I saw two big yellow glowing orbs about 20 feet up in the trees outside the cabin. I strained my eyes, trying to get a better look at what it might have been, but I couldn't make it out, whatever it was. So I ignored it and closed the window. I went back to bed. The following morning, I got up and made coffee for Gabe and I. Then I woke him up. As I waited for the coffee to be done, I went into the spare bedroom and got out our gear, including our guns. Once we were both ready and had our coffee, we set out together for a place called Willow River. After about an hour's walk, we arrived. We set up the blind and flattened the brush around it. Then we crawled in. It was after about 30 minutes that we started to see some activity. We spotted a doe with a fawn walking out into a clearing next to the river. We let them go, of course. We weren't there to orphan a young fawn that seemed to be only a few months old. After that, we had a four-point buck come out into the clearing. We left it alone, though. We were seeking bigger bucks than that. We didn't have much else come out into the clearing for a while, maybe about an hour and a half. But by then, suddenly, I started to smell a gut-wrenching stench that was almost unbearable. I thought it must have been a black bear, so we both tried to ignore it until the smell got even worse and worse. Then it came out into the clearing. We were looking at the most hideous looking deer we'd ever seen in our lives, extremely malnourished, bones breaking from its skin. One of its antlers had long since been snapped off, and it stank of rotten flesh and garbage. 
for a malnourished deer. It was very large, and its limbs seemed to be stretched out in this weird, disfigured way. After we looked at it, Gabe whispered to me, Should we put it out of its misery? That thing looks really sick. I responded, whispering back, Yeah, I guess. Looks like it's got rabies or something just as bad. Just then, that deer snapped its head up and stared straight at our blind. It then began to move closer to us. I raised my gun, ready to shoot, wanting to get a broadside shot, just in case I messed up the deer more if I went for a neck shot. But the deer didn't turn, and just kept coming closer, until I didn't notice that Gabe was pointing right at its head and pulled the trigger. After the smoke cleared, the deer was gone. But what we did see was a giant puddle of blood, right where the deer had been standing. We assumed it must have been hit, or at least grazed by the bullet. We waited a bit, then followed the blood trail. Several minutes later, the trail stopped at the base of a tree. The two of us were confused. We looked around the area, but all we found were scratches on some of the trees. We decided to pack it up and head back to the cabin. That included us going back to the clearing and picking up our blind. We walked back to the spot where we had left it, but when we got there, we found the blind torn to shreds. It reeked of the smell we had smelled on that deer. We tried to ignore the loss of the blind, walking back to the cabin without it. It was an unsuccessful hunt, and it was growing darker by the second. When we got back, the place was thrashed. Almost everything that had been inside had been pulled out or destroyed. As we looked around, I glanced towards the tree line outside and saw a pale figure standing about eight feet tall with the same broken and messed up antlers as the deer we'd shot. Then, from the direction of the figure, a gunt-wrenching scream resounded. It sounded like the cry of an angry man, mixed with the sound of a female elk in heat. As soon as we heard that, we both hopped in the truck and floored it home. After the events of that trip, I started to look into cryptids. The only match I could find that fit the description may be the Wendigo. And after hearing of its story... I just feel lucky to be alive. What did I see? From Appalachian Hiker 290 This happened in January of 2023. Now I'm of Native American blood, and I believe in the tales my grandmother often told me. At the time, we had just gotten a new dog. I'll call her A. I was taking A out on her nightly walk, which mostly leads to her chasing our local chickens. This night seemed normal, clouds covering the sky and moon, which was a disappointment, as I would have preferred them be out. Our local chickens were not out and about this time. It was cold and way past dark. It was a windy night, and the sounds of squirrels running up and down the trees often overcame the sounds of the wind. Suddenly, A stopped. She sniffed the air and started to jerk towards our shed. Then, out of nowhere, the wind stopped, and so did the rest of the noises around me. I was used to this. I knew that sometimes the woods can go silent, especially when a predator or a person was out in them. Not to mention the place I lived was known for mountain lions. A suddenly stopped tugging her way to the shed. I looked up towards the shed, and what I saw still chills me to my core this very day. Whatever it was, was huge, at least nine feet tall. I could only see the outline until I brought out my phone flashlight. The thing was unnaturally skinny, like it hadn't eaten a bite in months. You could see its bones and ribcage. Its fur was matted, and parts of it appeared to have been torn from its body. In certain places, you could see torn flesh. 
Its arms were unnaturally long and lanky, but the hands ended in razor-sharp claws, which appeared to be stained a deep red. The legs looked like the legs of a deer, but too long, too lanky. Its head was also shaped like a deer's, but with fur and spots only barely hanging in place. The eyes were small and black, but would chill any person to the bone looking into them. The antlers were those of a huge buck, but they seemed worn and weathered, like they'd been used for something besides show. I froze. A came off her leash and began to run to the house. The creature's head suddenly snapped in my direction, causing me to let out a sharp and quick shriek, and I dropped my phone to cover my mouth. By that time, my pit bull B and my Rottweiler C were running towards me, barking and raising cane. That snapped me out of my trance, causing me to scramble to my house. My grandmother came out of the house, yelling my name. Once I was almost back, only then did I turn back to look at the creature. I could still see it. As soon as I was in the safety of my house, the creature retreated to the woods. I bent over and gasped, almost throwing up. Whatever that thing was, it smelled like rotten animals and spoiled milk, which had been sitting out in the sun for far too long. My grandmother, worried, kept repeating the question, What did you see? What did you see? I was gasping for air. When I looked up and she saw the pure terror in my eyes, she simply said, You saw it, didn't you? It's been nearly a year since my encounter, but each and every time I go outside alone at night, I still feel watched, and I feel it's still out there. It Haunts Chattahoochee National Forest From Edgar I know what I saw that night, camping along the stream in Georgia a few summers back. It still rattles me whenever I talk about it. I had just finished high school and was doing some solo traveling before college started up. I'd heard good things about the trout fishing up in Chattahoochee National Forest, so I decided to go check it out and go camp a few days along one of the rivers that runs through it. I'll never forget the drive in from Atlanta. I was feeling that sense of freedom and excitement that comes with being out on your own for the first time. The forested roads got narrower and more secluded the closer I got to the area I'd marked on my map. By late afternoon, when I started setting up camp, I realized I hadn't seen another vehicle or even planes overhead for at least an hour. I wasn't nervous yet. Actually, I liked the isolation. I was out there surrounded by nothing but woods and water. I made a little fire pit, and I set up my tent as the shadows got along that first evening. I kept thinking what an awesome start to the trip. As the last light faded, I grabbed my new fishing rod and hiked over to a promising pool just downstream from my camp. Standing there as darkness fell all around me, I cast out my line. Almost immediately, simultaneously, Something felt wrong. Unsettled, I glanced around me, and I felt for the first time like I was being watched from the brush. I told myself to stop psyching myself out. I stood there in the deepening gloom waiting for a bite. Then I heard a loud splashing sound across the river. I jerked towards the sound, expecting to see an animal, but the woods were still. Strange, I remember thinking. My breath sounded extra loud in the sudden silence. I tried to focus. I turned my back to fishing, and almost immediately something snatched my line and yanked back. Whatever it was pulled hard. I swore in shock, bracing myself against the pull. For several minutes, I grappled with whatever was on the other end. At first, I thought it was a huge trout, or maybe a heavy sunken log. But then the line went completely slack. I nearly toppled backwards at the abrupt lack of resistance 
my heart hammering. I reeled my line in fast, half expecting to find my hook and lure shredded or missing, but they looked completely normal, undamaged when I got them up close. By then, total darkness had set in, so I shone my flashlight out at the now black woods and river. The beam only illuminated empty silence. For hours afterwards, I sat wide awake in my little tent, listening to the strangest cries I've ever heard in nature, coming from every direction just outside my camp. That was my first inkling that something bizarre lurked out there, but what I witnessed the next morning convinced me completely. I rose with the sun, exhausted from no sleep, yet oddly wired at the same time. Walking back to the river's edge in the gray dawn mist, I almost expected the night's events to already feel like a bad dream. But no sooner did I start casting into that same pool downstream when, across the water, two deer came walking out of the brush. Nothing too unusual at first, until I looked closer in the low morning light. One of the deer had a long, gruesome gash across its furry neck that glistened red and wet. Dangling loosely from the nasty cut was a chain with my lure still attached, glinting crimson as it swung. My breath left my body in horrified understanding. The lure hanging grotesquely from the gashed neck clearly belonged to me. The red paisley pattern on the skirt was one of a kind, custom made but I'd checked my tackle box just last night and it was still there. So someone had come into my camp, gone through my belongings while I lay frozen in my tent, unable to identify those chilling cries, then used my own lure to attack this helpless creature. The injured deer stared directly at me, its eyes glazed with what looked like unnatural intention. It was as if it was forcing me to witness its own suffering, fighting every instinct, urging me to run. I knew I had to help the poor animal somehow, or put it out of its misery. I managed to unsnag my pocket knife and flashlight from where I'd abandoned them on the rocky bank the night before. Cautiously crossing the water towards the deer while scanning desperately for predators, I felt totally exposed, wading across the narrow stretch of river. The icy water numbed my legs, to the point I stumbled over submerged roots and rocks, but I had to lock my senses onto getting to that deer. By the time I emerged, soaking wet onto the opposite bank a few yards downstream from the animal, I realized even if I could cut it free, its wound was beyond my first aid abilities. As I hesitantly approached the huffing, struggling deer, Part of me registered that it was unusual for the creature not to have already run from me, almost like something was prohibiting its movement, preventing its escape. The deer's dark eyes tracked my movements with an eerie cognition. Its nostrils kept flaring, not with the effort to breathe, but almost like it was trying to speak to me. I know it sounds crazy. My hand shook as I reached with the knife towards the bloody gash, desperate to grant this helpless being mercy. Just before I made contact, a blast of fetid air rushed from the deer's mouth directly into my face. I stumbled back, gagging on the unnatural stench as a strange hissing noise seemed to form within the breath, almost language-like in its cadence before it shifted into an anguished animal bleat. The deer's legs buckled in the same moment. I cried out, lurching forward to catch the creature in my arms as my knife clattered to the stones, our eyes still locked in a bizarre connection as I eased the spasming animal to the ground. Blood continued to pump from the yawning neck wound, now soaking into my clothes and skin. Then, with a final, almost grateful look from its deep brown eyes, the deer went still. I knelt over its body for I don't know how long, sobbing and shaking as the summer insects buzzed loudly around us. When I finally looked up and surveyed my surroundings, 
I had the disorienting sensation that the trees themselves had crowded closer in my distress, like spectators to a show. I knew in my bones more dark things lurked behind the silent trunks of those trees. I still wasn't prepared for the next discovery that would confirm that nothing in these woods was as it seemed. I'm not proud to admit it, but after witnessing the deer's agonizing last moments, I scrambled back over the scream in blind panic without even cleaning the bloody tackle off my arms. I also left my knife and flashlight, abandoned again, on the far bank in my hysteria to get away. There was no unseeing that awful sight, nor forgetting that lingering stench of decomposition that had flooded my nostrils when the deer had expelled its final wretched breath into my gaping mouth. Stumbling through the dim woods, I swatted madly at swarming insects, attracted to the bloodstains on my skin and clothes. I couldn't escape the feeling that I was not alone out here, because whoever, or whatever, had done that to the deer and had snuck into my campsite at night was still out there. By the time I reached my little camp, it was already mid-morning. I knew I had to leave, though, gathering whatever gear I could, leaving whatever I couldn't behind. As I hastily shoved a few possessions into my backpack with quaking mud-caked hands, a flock of crows burst from the treetops suddenly, cawing in loud agitation before going silent. The creatures seemed to hover motionless above my campsite, their dark outlines stark against the overcast sky. I forced myself to move faster, despite the frozen panic roaring in my ears. Before long, I was clamoring into the driver's seat of my old sedan. When I heard it, the sing-song voice of a little girl calling out right behind my vehicle. Wait, mister. We found your toy. Don't you want it? Every nerve ending ignited at once in my system as I whirled around to confront whoever had come into my camp. But when I turned back, I was met with only forest. No matter how long I looked and stared at each tree and thicket, I appeared to be alone. After a moment, though, I spotted something lying on the edge of the dirt road that was not there a few seconds earlier. A child's tea set, made of weathered plastic and missing a few pieces. It was deliberately placed behind my rear tire. Across the tiny cups and soiled saucers, a huge, offensively bright fishing lure had been draped like a special gift. My lure, again, returned straight from the gory neck wound of the fallen deer. I did not stop to investigate. I simply gunned the engine as a girlish laughter began to erupt all around, interlaced with the crow's warning cries. Even flooring the gas pedal, my car seemed to crawl through the thick woods for agonizing minutes before finally breaking past the last clutching tree branches onto a paved road. I peeled out so fast, the tires squealed for nearly a mile. When the bright, welcoming glow of distant civilization first crested into view after several miles, I cried like a little boy. Ever since then, I have not come back, though I do still have the occasional nightmare. Dreams of ghostly little girls in the woods and dead or dying deer. Just keep this in mind if you're ever out in the Georgia woods. There's something out there. Those forests are very haunted. Spending the Night with a Ghost from Greenwich When I was in high school, we used to go on a lot of field trips and activities. We had at least one or two activities every month, and it was mostly very nice. It felt great and was very motivating to always have something to look forward to. During my second year, we were supposed to go on a two-day trip to an amazing place in the mountains that was super fancy. We were all excited for it. 
Unfortunately, they had to cancel it for some reason. So, the teachers had to find a place last minute that could accommodate a group of 30 kids. We ended up going to a camp that no one had ever heard of. It was about two hours from the school and very secluded. When we got there, we were welcomed with a big sign that read, Welcome! We're celebrating our 100th anniversary. I must say that I still have this image engraved in my mind because when I saw that, chills ran down my spine. I'd always been very attracted to spooky stuff. I grew up with my dad, watching scary movies all the time, and I always loved a good scary story. But nothing could have prepared me for what was about to happen. We got out of the bus and were greeted by two young men who would be our guides for the trip. They showed us the dormitories first, so we could leave our stuff there and begin the activities. Of course, there were two dormitories, so we were separated, boys from girls. I was pleased to know that I would share my room with two of my best friends, M and P. We were assigned our room last because we had a special room. I've got to explain that the building was shaped like an L, while the longer part was divided into rooms that each contained two bunk beds. The smaller portion was only one big room with two bunk beds. The smaller part was almost detached from the longer part. We only had a door communicating with the rest of the building. We were quite excited about that, because it was the biggest room, and we would be far away from the teachers and everyone else. But when we opened the door to that room, we stopped immediately. Ugh, the smell. It smelled like someone had left rotten meat in there. It was so bad that we put our shirts over our noses, trying to filter it out. We tried looking everywhere to find the source, but couldn't find a thing. We had to go, though. The activities were starting. So I put the trash can outside, as it was the only thing I could think of that could be stinking that much even though it appeared to be clean. The first day went by, and we had a lot of fun. We went canoeing, playing games, finished the day around a big campfire. We went into the dormitory around 8 p.m. that night and talked with the other girls until around 9 p.m., since that would be our curfew. Everyone went to sleep after that, and we went back to our secluded room. The smell, though, was still very much there, but less intense than when we first arrived. So we didn't bother telling the teachers and went straight to bed ourselves. Of course, we didn't fall asleep right away. We had so much to talk about, you know? Kids on a field trip. I was alone in the bottom bunk bed on the right, M was in the upper bed on the left, while P was on the other bottom one. Only four or five feet separated the bunk beds, so we kept talking. All of a sudden, as I was saying something, I heard him saying something over me, but it was almost like she was whispering. I said to her, Sorry, what did you just say, Em? She replied, uh, Nothing. I didn't say anything. I think it was P. P immediately replied, uh, I didn't say anything. I thought that was you, Em. We all went quiet then. Then we heard it, a loud whisper coming from between the bunk beds. I gathered the courage to open my flashlight and light up the end of the left bunk bed where the sound had been coming from. But when I did, there was nothing there. It had definitely come from inside the room. To break the silence, I said out loud, Well, I guess it's time for us to go to sleep. After they both agreed, we silently hid in our sleeping bags. But somehow, we did manage to fall asleep, eventually. I woke up to a red light entering our room under the door, as my brain was slowly shaking off the dizziness of sleeping. I heard the fire alarm. I looked at the time on my iPod, and it was exactly 3 a.m. My friends woke up too, and we put our shoes on, opening the door. Everybody was being evacuated from the dormitory. Fortunately, there was no fire, 
but the alarm had not been pulled by someone since the little button was still intact. Somehow, some way, it had been set off by something else. The camp guide searched the whole place for half an hour, but couldn't find anything. So they gave us the okay to go back to our rooms. I don't know if I need to mention it, but we didn't fall asleep again right away. We wondered. Could it have been the same thing that was in our room earlier, setting off the alarm? Was it trying to warn us? We'll never know. The next morning, we were quite happy to leave that place. Even though we'd had fun during the activities, we'd had a wild night and were very exhausted. I'm still friends with M and P, and we sometimes talk about that night. I've had other weird experiences, but this is one I'll always remember. I'll always remember sitting on that bus, looking back at the welcome sign as we left. Two Stories from Hexmark 8598 Chased by Gargoyles I was talking to my younger cousin a while back. He brought up a very strange and terrifying encounter we had back when we were teenagers. So, for context, it was back in the early 2000s. I was staying on my uncle's farm way off in the middle of nowhere. I was 16 at the time. My cousin was 12. The farm itself was located on an old dirt road. It sat on a decent-sized plot of land, almost completely surrounded by woods. Just across the road from the house was the deepest section of those woods. My cousin and I had spent hours tromping through those woods, and we knew them fairly well. We'd ventured pretty deep into them, never found the other side where they ended. Now our grandfather, Freeman, and our grandmother, Ruby, had always said we could mess around in the woods as much as we wanted, but we should always get back home by sundown. Not just because of the panthers that roamed around the woods after dark, but they'd always been vague on the details. I remember every evening as the sun went down, my grandfather would go out and sit in his wooden rocking chair on the porch right after dinner to smoke his pipe, and he always had his 10-gauge double-barrel shotgun across his lap as he stared into the woods and smoked. We never knew what he was watching out for, but one day I think we found out what some of those things were. It was one day in early autumn. My cousin and I were out wandering in the woods once again, not doing anything in particular, just exploring really. I don't remember why we were out there for so long, but all of a sudden, we realized the sun was very low in the sky. It was getting dark, fast. So we started to head back towards home when we noticed some strange noises all around us. The trees and bushes rustled loudly, and we picked up our pace. As we speed walked towards the farm, I heard a particularly loud rustle from the bushes to my left followed by the strangest growl I'd ever heard. It wasn't any animal growl I could identify. My head snapped in the direction of the sound, and I saw a face peering back at me, back at us. Not a panther's face, not a wolf's. No, this face was almost human, but not quite. It had skin that was a grayish tan color, and almost looked like stone, and its eyes were this deep red shade. I yelled at my cousin to run, and I put myself between this creature and him. My cousin didn't hesitate, and he bolted on ahead. The creature let out this screech and began to chase after us. It was running alongside us at one point, screeching. The more it shrieked, the more the woods came alive with movement and other screeches. I looked behind us at one point, and I saw a second creature back there. But this one was in the trees, jumping to and fro. It was larger than the one running alongside us. It was nearly fully dark at this point, but we were almost to the dirt road. I wasn't sure if we were both going to make it, 
as I prepared myself to confront these things in order to protect my cousin. Then we saw the edge of the tree line just ahead. My heart felt like it was going to pound out of my chest, and I realized I'd been holding my breath for some time. We burst from those woods, my cousin screaming in terror, and me yelling for someone to open the door as we hit the front porch. But I didn't wait for the door to open. I smashed through the screen door and collapsed in the floor, gasping for air. My uncle was just sitting in his father's old chair, looking at me, shaking his head like he knew what had happened. As he got up, he grabbed that old tin gauge from the wall, and he said calmly, See why you're supposed to be home before dark? Then he stepped out into the yard. Thing is, I never heard him fire the gun. Never heard any more screeches, either. So I figured whatever those things were contented themselves to just chasing us away from their domain. I recall just passing out right there in the floor. The next morning, when I went outside for a cigarette, I looked towards those woods. I saw three figures standing just inside the tree line, as still as statues. Of course, my uncle was already out there, shotgun across his lap. He looked at me as he puffed on his own cigarette and said, Great, you pissed off the gargoyles. That was the first encounter I had with them. A few months after that, after the last of the summer's lingering warmth was gone and the nights had gotten colder, my uncle and I stepped outside and saw what at first we thought was a man. It was near one of the cars in the driveway. It was too dark to see clearly what it was, but my uncle pulled the 9mm pistol he always had on his hip and told whoever, or whatever it was, that if it didn't leave, they were going to get shot. The figure crawled up on the trunk of the car and my uncle fired at it, three shots in rapid succession. Every bullet found its mark, but when they hit, it sounded like he had just fired into a solid stone surface. All we heard was that distinct sound a bullet makes when it ricochets off rock. Then I heard that all too familiar screech, as what we now referred to as a gargoyle, launched itself into the air and dove towards us. We ran back inside quickly. For a few minutes, we heard the creature circling the house, shrieking intermittently. Then suddenly, something slammed into the side of the wall. Hard. The pictures on the wall shook, and two of them even fell. After that, things went silent. The next morning, we went and looked at where the creature had smashed into the house. The siding on that side was busted. Little pieces and chunks from the house lay on the ground. From then on, my cousins were never allowed out after it got dark. And if my uncle and I did go out, we always had either a large caliber hunting rifle or that old shotgun. Missouri Howler This one has a certain mystery to it, as I never saw the creature in question. But boy, did I hear it. I even found the tracks it left behind. Better put on your seatbelt for this one. This one happened on an early summer night around 2005. I was again at my uncle's farm in BFE. I remember it was early summer, as my uncle Sow had just had piglets a week or so before all this happened. It was around 10 p.m. My cousins were in bed, and my uncle and I were sitting in the living room, watching some TV and making some small talk. At some point... I just felt the entire atmosphere change. Everything was quiet, other than the TV. Which, when you have newborn piglets, it's rarely quiet. The hair on my arms and the back of my neck raised up, and I just had this overpowering sense of dread in my gut. I had no idea what the source of it was, but I was feeling very anxious. My uncle, as ever, was stoic and while he would occasionally glance out the window, he never said anything, and we never addressed the odd feeling that had settled over the room. 
My anxiety got the better of me and I stood up, grabbing his hunting rifle, saying I was going to smoke and check on the pigs, as they should not have been this quiet. My uncle gave a kind of patronizing chuckle and said, You can smoke in here tonight, but you definitely should not go out there. I looked at him, somehow only more confused by his vague warning, but I put the gun back, and as I sat down, I asked him why I shouldn't go out there, when those piglets definitely needed to be checked on. I had, after all, risked life and limb and a pin with a very aggressive sow in a very powerful thunderstorm to make sure they'd made it into the world to begin with. Then, as if on cue, there was this howl outside. It sounded like a wolf, if a wolf had lungs the size of a full-grown man. It didn't quite hit the same octave as a wolf. It had this bass to it that kind of reverberated the air itself. <sighs> That's why, he said, still in his infuriatingly calm tone. What the heck was that? I asked, jumping up and going towards the window. Just leave it be. It'll be gone soon. Now I was getting pretty irritated by his constant evasiveness. Fine, but what is it? My uncle put a potato chip in his mouth, still watching the TV, chewing slowly and swallowing, before finally saying, Just don't worry about it. As long as we don't go out there, it'll leave us alone. It always has before. There was another howl, much closer this time. I was still in full-on fight mode, with so much adrenaline pounding through my body, I couldn't stop shaking or sit still. I was pacing the room, which was what finally aggravated my uncle, who snapped at me to stop. That's when we heard it. Heavy footsteps outside. The two of us went silent. It was almost like something had sucked all the oxygen from the room. The footsteps were right outside. Slow, heavy footsteps. As we listened, it began circling the house. I was now frozen in place, holding my breath, when there was another howl, right behind the house. This time, that bass to it vibrated my chest. Seconds later, there was this blood-curdling scream from the pig pen. Then all went silent again. All I could do was sit down, hanging my head in my hands. I knew what that sound meant. I didn't sleep well that night, and at first light, I went outside. I couldn't believe what I saw. Massive paw prints the size of dinner saucers circled the house. Huge impressions in the ground, complete with dew claw marks. They circled the house twice, then led straight to the pig pen. I followed them and I found exactly what I'd been expecting. The piglets were gone. No remains were there to be found, and that mean old sow had been ripped to pieces. It broke my heart, but I couldn't help but think, better them than my family or me. Here's the interesting bit about those paw prints. Judging by the gait of them, whatever made them was bipedal. I'm not going to cry werewolf here, as there was no full moon, so I guess it was some kind of wolfish man. I don't know. My uncle seemed to know something about it, but he wouldn't tell me. Not then, and not even to this day. Whatever it was, he knew, and he took it with him to his grave when he passed away only three years ago. All I'm left with are a lot of questions, and speculation as to what it might have been. But thank the stars, that was the only time I was there when that creature came by for dinner. Not long ago, I told a friend this story and he thought about it for a moment. Then he said it could well have been the Missouri Howler. After a little research of my own, maybe I'm inclined to agree with him. An Extremely Disturbing Memory from Cabin Trauma. That weekend trip out to my uncle's cabin with my dad and cousin Ron when I was 12 years old 
changed me forever. It was only supposed to be an easy little getaway in early fall. A chance to do some fishing, have a campfire, and hang out before school started up. But what happened the very first night would change the way I see the world. Dad was excited to take me and Ron out to his brother's cabin by the lake for the first time. He kept going on and on about how we'd have the place to ourselves to do whatever we wanted. Don't get me wrong, I was pumped too. Sounded awesome. The leaves were just starting to turn colors as we drove out there, stopping for pizza and soda on the way so we wouldn't have to cook. The cabin itself was pretty simple. Two tiny rooms and a loft upstairs under the slanted roof that Ron and I would share while Dad took the main room. We immediately claimed top bunks, rushed outside to gather sticks for s'mores, and pastored Dad about fishing trips we could take once it got dark. You know, normal kid stuff. After we gorged ourselves on burnt marshmallows, and Dad let us sip his beers around the fire, Ron conked out in the top bunk as soon as the lights were out. But I couldn't sleep right away, up there under the low rafters. The not-so-distant shrieks of animals and branches scraping the roof kept distracting me. I wasn't really scared being from the country and all, just wound up, I guess. I have no idea what time it was when I startled awake later that night. The first thing I noticed was how icy cold the room felt on my face. That's when I saw that the loft door was wide open at the top of the stairs, letting frigid air rush in. Confused, I leaned over the bed railing, expecting to see the glow of the downstairs lights on. But the cabin below was pitch black, and dead silent, except for a strange intermittent wheezing sound. The hairs on my arms stood at attention as I strained to see through the darkness towards that weird noise. It sounded like some kind of sick animal struggling to breathe. That's when I noticed the moisture on the wooden floor by my bed. Too dark to make out colors, but something had left a wet, shiny trail across the old floorboards, all the way from the open doorway to the side of my mattress. My stomach turned to water as goosebumps erupted everywhere. I was frozen as I stared down at whatever was next to me, wheezing there in the dark. I could just barely make out a heap of matted fur, hunkered against the bed frame. The wet trail led directly to it. In the shadows, its fur almost seemed to ripple and move over bulky flesh, its breath coming out in sporadic, guttural bursts. I squinted desperately, were those gnarled hands emerging from the fur and I nearly yelped out when I glimpsed it. A distorted head with pointed ears twitching atop a distorted body convulsing on the floor. My heart stuttered in my chest. I couldn't even cry out to Dad or Ron. I stayed under my blankets, shivering. I squeezed my eyes shut, praying it was some terrible dream. But the image blazed behind my eyelids. The human-like hands, canine head, it was a mismatched living nightmare, and it was right beside my bed, soaked in some dark fluid, and it was morphing and changing. Between wheezes, I began to hear cracking sounds, like its bones breaking and reshaping. All I could do was lay paralyzed in pathetic silence, waiting for the wheezing to stop. After what felt like forever... Over the frantic pounding of my heart in my ears, I detected labored footsteps crossing the small room, and the sucking of air as the outside door slowly swung shut, enclosing me in safety once again. I never told Dad or Ron what I saw. The next morning, they saw the wet trail. The three of us even found mangled squirrels and a bloody trail on the porch, leading out towards the woods that no one mentioned out loud over breakfast. I hardly slept the next two nights, listening to things rustling outside instead. I don't know what that was, and I still don't like thinking about it. But I won't ever forget it either. To have seen something like that, and to know that things like that exist, 
I think I might be scared of the dark forever. Six Years in a Haunted House From Miss Aligned It was October of 2003 when my small family moved into a new house. Newly built, so no one lived there before us. It was a cute little blue ranch house, located in the middle of nowhere in Michigan. It had a bright and sunny open floor plan, three bedrooms, two and a half acres surrounded by woods. It was adorable, perfect. The first thing my husband and I did was set up the nursery, as our daughter was only six months old at the time. The first night there, it was unreasonably hot. When I got my daughter ready for bed, I grabbed her footy pajamas from the dresser. Then I thought, it's too hot for pajama feet, so I left the PJs on her changing table and put her to bed in her onesie. The next morning, I woke up to her crying like she was agitated. This wasn't like her. So I went to her room, and I kid you not, her feet had been pulled through the slats of the crib, and the footy pajamas had apparently floated across the room because the pajama feet were on her feet outside the crib. I was horrified. Yeah, that was night one. I didn't tell my husband about this. He would think I was crazy. So I chalked it up to maybe it was his deceased mother. I tried to forget about it, but the activity here did not stop there. We lived in that house for six years, and a lot happened. I'll give you some highlights. We had doors opening and closing, faucets turning on full blast, TV and radio going on and off. You know, regular haunting type stuff. But it seemed like every time I had a baby, the activity ratcheted up a level. After my first son was born, things intensified. I was exercising in the basement. Well, stretching actually. And something breathed in my ear. And I mean like a violent exhale right by my ear. Then it started to flick my earrings randomly throughout the day. So I stopped wearing anything dangly. It started moving things around in my daughter's room. At one point, we couldn't get into the bathroom because a vanity drawer had been opened, blocking the door. At this point, I was terrified, but we couldn't afford to leave, and the kids were too little to know what was happening. My husband was a skeptic. I was a stay-at-home mom, so I was there alone most of the time, while my husband was at work. He didn't get to experience everything that I did. Although he was there for some of it, he always played it off, like this could be normal. Then I got pregnant with my third, and all hell seemed to break loose. I remember being sick as a dog, sitting on the couch while the four and six-year-olds were napping. Randomly, a battery-operated toy sitting next to me went off. I thought the batteries must have been dying, because battery-operated toys do go kooky sometimes when that happens. But then another toy went off in the mudroom to my right. Then one went off in the dining room to my left. Then the one next to me went off again. It went around and around, getting faster and faster until I finally broke down and said, Stop it. You're scaring me. Then everything went silent. At this point, I was staying outside with the kids as much as possible. I felt more secure out there. But one day I was taking the kids to the library, and halfway there I turned around, as I'd forgotten something. When we got back home, my daughter's tricycle was sitting in the middle of my parking spot. It had to have been pushed up the hill just to get there. That was a terrifying moment when I realized it could go outside. We weren't safe anywhere. Then things got more physical. Up to this point, I could tell myself it was creepy, but harmless. But one day, my six-year-old came out of her bedroom and she was mad. She was holding a stuffed animal, asking me why I threw it at her. Clearly, I hadn't, but something had. She had also started noticing the things in her room were moving around while she was asleep. 
One night, I was awakened by the feeling of my bra strap being snapped. I thought, was I dreaming that? Right as something snapped it again. Nope, that wasn't a dream. But which kid is doing this? Then, with much effort, I flipped my huge pregnant belly to the other side and looked into the face of no one. I knew there was someone there, but I couldn't see them. A number of days later, my four-year-old son was walking down the hallway to show me one of his Lego inventions, and I saw something invisible shove him into the wall, sending his invention crashing to the ground. He asked what happened, and I said it must have been the dogs, at which point he went to the couch where the two dogs were sleeping at the time. He said, No, 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 that was bad. Things were starting to get violent. Then came the last straw. My daughter came to me and said, Mommy, I think my guardian angel wants to know what I look like when I'm scared. A chill ran down my spine. I asked her to elaborate. My six-year-old daughter said, It climbs up onto my bed at night, and it watches me sleep. That has stuck with me. It climbs up. My skin crawled, even 14 years later. It was at that point I told my husband, I'm done. I'm leaving. I don't care if we go bankrupt. I don't care if we have to live in the car. I'm out. And he got us out. We bought a second house and moved. We had one income and two house payments, and we were flat broke. But I had never been happier. I was terrified that it would follow us, but it didn't. Thank God. Now to my great pleasure, I must disclose, my husband spent a few weeks fixing up odds and ends in the house by himself before we could sell it. Without dogs and kids to blame on things, he noticed the weird happenings and admitted that the house was haunted, and he apologized for making me stay there for six years. I told myself I would never enter that house again, but I had to clean it to sell it. So I pulled into that long gravel driveway one last time, parking in my old spot and trying to prepare myself. I was terrified. Things were quiet to start with, but while I cleaned the kitchen, I asked my husband to pick up his tools in the mudroom. Then I heard him messing around in the basement. I thought, of course he isn't doing what I asked him, chuckling to myself. Then I heard a strange sound from the window, and to my surprise, I saw my husband sweeping the garage. Still not what I asked, but I digress. I was listening to boxes being tossed in the basement, but there my husband was outside. I just turned up the radio and finished cleaning, then got the heck out of there. I have some advice. If you move into a place and think it might be haunted, ignore, ignore, ignore. Do not talk about it. Whatever happens, blame it on the cat, blame it on the kids, the wind, whatever. And whatever you do, don't talk to it. Do not call it out. That's what it wants. It wants attention. And by the way, we did have the house cleansed and blessed by an ordained minister before selling it. So hopefully, whoever moved in after us had a better time with the place. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at EerieCast.store or unlock tons of cool extras, like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks, add free access to all our shows, and a huge 20% discount on all our merch 
all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com slash plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.